My name is Brian Gregory, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Biology at the University of Pennsylvania. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is genomic studies of human health-related issues. And what I mean by this, since this was just a mouthful of jargon that came, came out, is I'm going to talk to you about the large-scale studies that are going on to identify the underlying genetic changes that affect human genetic disorders. And then at the very end of my talk today, I'm going to present a few slides of work from my own lab that suggests a very interesting potential mechanism for many of these slides and how they are actually affecting human biology to result in these genetic disorders. And so if you take nothing else away from my talk today, what I hope you do remember is this first slide here, which shows you the central dogma, which states that DNA is transcribed into RNA, and RNA is then translated into protein. And as many of us are taught um, in the field of biology, what we really think about is these RNAs, the second step in the central dogma, being turned into the final protein product. And what I'm going to show you is, in fact, that's still really what these human health-related studies is fo are focusing on, are these changes in RNA that could potentially affect protein. But what I want to also argue from the studies, not for, from other labs and from my own lab, that in fact we need to be thinking more, more broadly about the second step and all the regulation that occurs at the, at the level of RNA within the central dogma. And so just to kind of introduce that idea here, what I want to remind you of is in fact that when you look at the human genome and its protein coding or RNA coding capacity, mRNA coding capacity, messenger RNA coding capacity, what you need to remember is that the RNAs in the genomic context look very, very different than what they look like when they are made into the final product, which is actually going to be recognized for that process of translation to be turned into proteins. And so what I want to emphasize here is that in the genomic context of genes that are going to be turned into messenger RNAs, there are, uh, there are the protein coding regions known as the exons, which in this slide you can see are overrepresented by the colored boxes that are slightly larger than the white boxes in between them. But those white boxes in between them are also very important parts of messenger RNAs. Specifically, these are the non-coding intervening pieces of, of protein coding messenger RNAs known as introns. Okay? What I also want you to notice on this slide is if you look on the left and the right, there are different patterns of colored boxes that have been put together with each other. Okay? And what this is to denote is the process of alternative splicing. What we're beginning to realize now is that the protein coding capacity of the human genome is much, much greater than we originally thought when we thought, saw that there was 27 to 30,000 total protein coding genes. And the protein coding capacity of the human genome is actually expanded by this process of alternative splicing, whereby in one cell type, you'll put together the blue, the red, the purple, and the yellow exons are protein coding regions of the gene. And in another cell type or in another context, i.e. stress response, you put the blue, red, green, and yellow together. And in fact, in this way, you can greatly expand and change the protein coding capacity of a single gene between cell types or between different developmental contexts or between different stress responses. Okay. And so what I want to also argue is this process of splicing in these intervening non-coding sequences known as introns, you're going to see in a few slides from now that these are an incredible um, area of human genetic variation that has been linked now to human genetic disorders. And what this is most likely a byproduct of is this process of alternative splicing, whereby it's affecting the splicing and changing the downstream RNA, which leads to a change in the downstream product. And both work from others, other people's groups and my group are really starting to suggest that this might be a major mechanism causing these underlying human genetic disorders. So I also want to introduce you to another term that I said on that very first title slide, and that term is genomics. And what I mean when I say the term genomics, or what anybody means really when they say the term genomics, is these are large-scale studies, whereby instead of looking at a single protein coding mRNA, we try to look at all of the protein coding mRNAs or all of the nucleotides that make up the entire human genome. And so when I talk about genomics, what I'm talking about is trying to study all 3.2 billion bases that make up the human genome all at the same time within our experiments that we set up 
And so the experiments that I'll be focusing on today are experiments to find the underlying genetic changes that result in human genetic disorders. And so in order to do this, what we really do is we go through and we look at the differences in genomes from one person to another and then say, in a normal person versus a diseased person or a person with that genetic disorder, what are the SNPs or what are the changes that are specific to the person with the genetic disorder that we don't see in the normal or healthy population. And so the point being here is in order to do these types of studies, we do, do need to know the entire sequence of the human genome, which we do. We also needed to go through and profile the, the, the sequence of many human genomes, which have been done, and I'll talk about that here in a second. And so what I'm going to be talking about today is really all of the changes within the human genome that affect protein coding mRNAs wherever they are outside of protein coding mRNAs that have been linked to human genetic disorders. But I do just want to remind you that even within protein coding genes, there's lots of non-coding sequence. And this has become important for some points I'm going to make later on in the talk today. So I want to start now talking about human genetic variation in general. And what you need to know is that in general, every human on this planet has the same 27,000 to 30,000 protein coding messenger RNAs encoding within their, 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 their genome. So we have the same set of genes, but we have different forms of these genes. These different forms are known as, in jargony terms, alleles. Okay? And so there are different alleles of the genes that affect eye color, for instance, that lead to me having brown eyes whereas leading to some other person, i.e. my brother, having blue eyes, okay? Leading me to have brown hair versus my brother having blonde hair. We come from the same two parents, but we obviously picked up different combinations of alleles of the genes encoding our eye color and our hair color that led to these different manifestations of phenotypes. And so the point being here is when we talk about human genetic variations, Really what it is is it's these small underlying changes in the genome of somebody affected with, a human, with, a, with one of these genetic disorders that leads to that different manifestation of a, of a behavioral or a, or a phenotype that can be witnessed as a genetic disorder. Okay, and so what you can see here is what we're looking at is the passing of genetic material from a father and a mother to their, to their, their progeny, okay? And what you can also see is that there's obviously different alleles of, in this case, of an over-dramatized genetic disorder that can lead to two of their progeny being affected, because in this case they got the dominant disease allele versus the two normal manifesting phenotype that did not get that dominant disease-causing allele leading to their normal or healthy phenotype, as we call them. And these differences or these slight changes are more often than not caused by what we call single nucleotide polymorphisms. These genetic disorders in general are caused by single one or a few base pair substitutions caused within the human genome of an affected person versus a normal person. And so what we talk about within this field of human genetic disorders are the SNPs, or the single nucleotide polymorphisms, the single nucleotide changes in the human genome that manifest a disease in one person, whereas a different allele in a different person leads to a normal phenotype in that person. And what you need to know is that there is an incredible amount of genetic variation, even be from one normal person to another normal person. So please don't think that somebody with a genetic disorder has an incredible set of SNPs, and that's what makes them have this disorder versus a normal person. It can literally be, literally be one change in that person from a normal person, a normal sibling, that leads to them manifesting this different phenotype versus what we consider a normal, healthy phenotype. In fact, as you can see on this slide here, in, within a human genome, when you compare one human to another person, there's a single nucleotide polymorphism that occurs about every 1,250 bases. And in fact, I just want to make this point very, very clear to you on this, second, this next slide here, what I mean by a SNP. Um, what I mean by a SNP is exactly what I was saying. It is a single nucleotide polymorphism, meaning you have a single base pair difference from one human to another. So in this slide here, what you can see is one human has version 1, whereby at that exact same position within the human genome, human 1 has the A variant. In human 2, they might have version 2, then which means then that they have the C or the cytosine version of that of that position of the genome. And the point being here is it can be something that subtly different. 
the normal have an A at that position of the genome, and a diseased person has a C nucleotide at that position of the genome in that protein coding mRNA that leads to them having the diseased phenotype versus the normal phenotype. And so the point being here is we need to go through and figure out what are the substitutions at different positions leading to these different phenotypes and the, uh, that underlie um, human genetic, genetic disorders. And so just to go back here, I also just want to point out and re-emphasize the point that all humans, if you look on average comparing one human to another, have a change about every 1,250 base pairs across their entire genome. Most of these changes obviously lead to absolutely no visual difference between human A and human B, okay? But there are those underlying changes that do affect protein coding mRNAs in one way or in another that do lead to these genetic disorders, and these are the types of SNPs that we really want to figure out, find, find them, and then figure out how they affect human biology to lead to that different human phenotype. Okay, and so I need to give you some background for this slide here. Um, how we got to the idea of on this slide where I say you can genotype all of the SNPs or most of the common SNPs across the human um, genome using a single chip or using a single genome sequencing experiment, also known as an exome sequencing experiment. The way we came about this type of, of approach, i.e. these genotyping arrays as they're called, or these exome sequencing experiments where we can look for those single nucleotide polymorphisms within only the protein coding regions of the genome, was by sequencing a number of different human genomes from across a diverse population of, of human beings. And so what you can see, we've over, I've overemphasized for you on this slide here, there was a number of humans selected across the North American populations of people. There was a number of people selected across the various populations of the European people, the African people, the Asian people. And the point being there then is that across, by profiling all of these different human genomes, you can look at the vast array of single nucleotide poly polymorphisms or differences in coding capacity across the entire human genome. And so what was found based on all this profiling across all of the continents and across approximately 10,000 people at this point was that there are about 1.9 million regions of the human genome, at least within, the, w within and around the protein coding regions of the human genome that tend to have quite a bit of polymorphism. And you can also use these 1.9 million positions to actually get an, a complete genotype of every human to compare one human compa compared to all of the rest of the human, the human population. And so the point being here is, is what I'm going to show you in these next slides then is taking advantage of these arrays, profiling those 1.9 million regions of the genome that tend to vary quite a bit across the human populations on the face of the planet, how that we've used these arrays now to compare normal patients to affected patients to find out the changes, the genomic changes in the affected people that aren't there in the normal to try and get down to those SNPs, those alleles that are causing the human genetic disorders versus those that we don't see in the normal population that don't have those genetic disorders, okay? And so this is the idea behind what I was talking about there. These are what are known as genome-wide association studies or GWAS studies, okay? And it goes by the principle of if we take a lot of normal patients or a lot of normal people that aren't affected by this just genetic disorder, and we take a lot, not maybe not the exact same amount, but at least a, quite, quite a few, and what you need to know here is really you need to start to get enough power to do these types of studies. You want on average about 1,000 normal and about 1,000 affected if possible. Obviously, the, the beginning of these studies was hundreds and hundreds, but what we're learning, there's lots of very small and discrete changes within the affected population, and in order to get the, the enough power to find those discrete changes, you need many, many, um, as many patients as you possibly can to, to put into these studies, and as many normals as you can to put into these studies. And the point being here is what you're looking for is you take the DNA samples, so you take DNA, usually it's just you take a little bit of blood from normal or a little bit of blood from affected. What people might also be seeing these days is there's lots of cheek swabbing going on. Um, so people will just also rub a little um, applicator on the cheek. You can get DNA from the cells of your cheek that come off onto that applicator as well. It's very easy. The point being is anytime you give blood and somebody says they're going to run a genetic test, 
this is basically what they're doing. They're taking your blood, the DNA out of your blood, and then genotyping usually one specific gene if they know they're testing for a very specific disorder for you. But in this case, we're trying to find, we don't know the gene affected. We don't know the potential RNA and protein that are affected. So we need to genotype every gene, right, using those arrays. So we take DNA from lots of normal people, hybridize each sample onto their own array, so each person is genotyped separately. We also take the DNA from those diseased patients. Once again, each patient sample goes on an array. So we have thousands of arrays with normal, thousands of arrays with um, diseased. And then what we go through, what, is, what you do, is you go through and you look for the SNPs that you only find, or that you find more often, significantly more often, in your diseased population than in your normal population. And so just to kind of overemphasize that here, once again, I've drawn cartoon representation of the control sample, which I'm overrepresenting as the blue um, sample population on this slide. You also can see you have the disease population on this slide, which I'm overrepresenting in green. And the reason why I'm overrepresenting in those two colors is because of how the bottom slide um, then looks. What you can see is each one of those normal samples went onto what is called a SNP chip or a SNP array. Each one of those diseased samples went onto the same type of array, and so you have thousands of normal or control, thousands of diseased or people manifesting the genetic disorder. And then what you do is you look for those SNPs that you find much, much more often in the diseased population than in the control population, which on the bottom slide then are overrepresented by those green dots. Okay. And so that's why the, the green population is colored in green and the blue population is colored in blue is because those green dots on the graph below are the regions, are those SNPs, those single nucleotide polymorphisms that you see much, much more often in the disease population than you do in the normal population. And so when you run statistical tests to say where are the SNPs or what are the SNPs that we see more often in our disease population than we see in our control population, you can see that they start to rise out above what you would just consider the normal genetic variation, which is shown then with the blue, the dark blue and the light, the dark and light blue spots on this, on this graph below here. So what this is telling you then are the genes or those regions of the genome where we see lots of green dots coming out those are the regions that you're going to want to follow up and study and say what is potentially the underlying biology going on in these regions leading to those differences in human phenotype between the normal and the, and the diseased population. Okay, and so just to overemphasize this, the first slide I showed you, sorry, let me go back. The first slide I showed you a study where type 1 diabetes was profiled. And you can see there was about 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 7 or 8 genes that came out from that first study of type 1 diabetes where we could find SNPs linked to those genes that suggested these genes might have some underlying biology within that disease population that is not present in the control population. This has now been done with a number of other um, genetic disorders. So what you're looking at on this slide here is bipolar disorder is one of those, those disorders, it's coronary artery disease. Crohn's disease, you can once again see that type 1 diabetes overrepresented here again. And also you can see type 2 diabetes, which what you should also learn from the type 1 diabetes graph versus the type 2 diabetes is that the underlying biology, the genes that are affected within type 1, tend to be very, very different than type 2. Okay, so that's the other type of information we can learn from these types of studies is the fact that even, gene, even diseases that look very, very linked oftentimes can be very, very distinct in the biology underlying what is causing those, those specific disorders. Um, and I think that's very nicely represented on this slide here when you compare type 1 diabetes to type 2 diabetes. And so I'm going to run through a set of sl three slides for you very, very quickly now just to kind of show you that and overrepresent the fact that there have been many, many studies on many different disorders um, from cancer to many types of genetic disorders that affect many people to very few people within the human population. But we've learned a lot and we found many gene loci that have been linked to these specific disorders, to these specific diseases that we can now go in as biologists and test what type of function is going on to affect the bi a biology and lead to these types of, of genetic disorders. What I will tell you also is that those slides are a bit out of 
a bit out of out of date um, because I went all the way back into the mid two thousand mid two thousands and the point being is we, many hundreds to thousands of diseases have now been profiled in this way so please don't think that this type of approach has stopped and that we're not profiling disease after disease. In fact, what I hope you can see here by each one of these little colored dots on this slide that I stole stolen from the um, National Institutes of uh, National Genomic Institute from the NIH is that many studies of human genetic disorders and diseases have been done in this fashion, both either by sequencing or by these SNP arrays. And so now we have a very good kind of genomic map looking at the regions of the genome that are linked to these types of diseases that we can now go in and study the underlying biology of these types of disorders. So I'm going to say this now and I'll come back to this point because this is what's going to be important for the stuff that I show you, the slides that I show you of the research that comes from my lab. Is what I've talked to you about so far is identifying loci linked, suggested to be part of that human genetic disorder, right? This does not say that gene is the cause of that disease. It just says all we can say from these types of studies is that this gene is overrepresented or SNPs in this gene are overrepresented in the disease population as compared to the normal population. It does not tell us how that is leading to that phenotype, okay? So what that means is we do not know the mechanism by which these SNPs, these changes, are leading to disease. And so what I'm going to show you at the end of my talk today is some very intriguing results from my lab that suggest that we might be not studying one of the more important mechanisms by which many of these, these, these disease SNPs are actually affecting the underlying basic biology, human biology, that then manifests itself in these different disease phenotypes. I'm also just going to introduce you from a general standpoint here. I do want you to notice that at least these last two slides and a few others here, this is publicly available information. So for those of you that want to go on and browse through these types of databases or find this type of information for yourself, it is publicly available because the government has funded all of this work. And so on the previous slide, as I'm going back to here, this is the published report of the GWAS SNPs. So you can go on and see all of the diseased or the alleles that have been linked to the various diseases done by the publicly funded GWAS or genome-wide association studies types of, of experiments. And you might also want to go in and look at what's known as the OMIM database or the Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man database. So this database is a bit different. So in the GWAS database, what that is saying is these are the SNPs found by a GWAS study, genome-wide association study, that have been linked to those specific disorders that you can go in and read about. Meaning there's no biology, there's no direct link, there's just saying that those, dis those SNPs, those alleles, have been found to be overrepresented in that diseased population versus a normal population, okay? It doesn't say that this is the disease causative SNP. It just says those SNPs are overrepresented in that disease. OMIM is a bit different. This, in fact, is a more direct link. These are the SNPs whereby a human being has walked into a doctor's office, been diagnosed with a genetic disorder, and they went in because we already knew some of the genes linked to those disorders. The doctor then did one of those genetic tests where they took the blood and they directly profiled for the SNPs in the loci that had been linked to that disease, found the SNP, the disease SNP linked to that disease. And so in here what you can find are this SNP has been linked to cause this disease. So this is a much more directed type of database whereby patients manifesting these phenotypes, these genetic disorders, have already been, been genotyped for that exact SNP, and that exact SNP has been linked or found to cause that exact disease. Okay, and the reason why I'm overrepresenting or discussing these databases quite a bit for you is because I'm gonna actually use the data from these databases in a slide from work from my lab a little bit later on in this talk, whereby what we just said was, can we find overrepresented for these disease-linked SNPs? And when we look at the OMIM database, this is very important, right? Because 
these are direct, we, we know these SNPs directly cause that disease. So if we see overrepresentation of these types of SNPs within the genomic information we're trying to profile, this then gives a very direct link that those SNPs may literally be causing those diseases by the mechanism that I'm going I'm to I'm suggest for you later. Okay. So now I just want to introduce to you guys, moving forward here, that right, I'm going to actually argue for a different type of mechanism than what most people look for when they do one of these genome-wide association studies or when they do one of these OMIM types of, of, of genotyping um, experiments on a patient in their, their office. And so what everybody looks for, and this is why I introduced you to that central dogma in the very first slide of the talk today, what everybody tries to think about are the changes that are found in these GWAS studies or these genotyping experiments that affect the coding region. Okay? The region of the mRNA that was overrepresented by those colored boxes put together, right? Because those colored boxes put together, those are what are going to make the underlying protein. And so what people are focused on are the GWAS SNPs or the SNPs that change the, uh, the underlying geno genetic code, the, gene the underlying mRNA code that leads to that protein. So in essence, what everybody is focused on are changes within the genome that lead to a change in the final product, the protein. And what I'm going to suggest today, and what I'm going to show you today, is that much of the information that we're getting from these genome-wide studies suggests that we're missing the boat. There are some diseases that obviously are going to be caused by changes in protein coding capacity. That's very obvious. And in cases of some diseases, you know, you are going to have a change in one gene that changes its ability to code for that protein and that's going to cause the disease. But what we're learning from many of these studies is we need to start thinking outside of this coding region change box and start looking at non-coding sequences, including the regulatory sequences which I've overrepresented in this slide here that I'm showing you in red. What I also, and I spent a lot of time talking about those non-coding regions, those intronic regions that are in between the protein coding regions, those exonic regions that I overrepresent in colored boxes. And the reason why I spent some time talking about those introns is because what I'm going to show you on this next slide is this is also a region heavily peppered or with lots and lots of linked disease SNPs falling within these regions. And so what I'm showing you on this slide here is basically where if you take these two databases or if you take that GWAS database of SNPs and you say, where are those SNPs falling within the, the, the human genome? What I hope you can see here in the, in the blue section, the darker blue section, the biggest portion of the human genome or most, the majority of all human disease-linked SNPs found by these GWAS studies fall right into that region that I spent quite a bit of time talking about in that first slide, the intronic portions of, pr of protein coding mRNAs. Not the portion that makes the protein, that portion that is in between the protein coding portion most likely involved in regulating splicing. And that's also why I brought up this idea of regulating how the protein looks in one cell type versus another because we're really starting to think that what's going on is these intronic sequences are where lots of proteins, RNA binding proteins, I'm going to introduce you to that term because we're going to get to that here in a second as well, where lots of RNA binding proteins bind and these RNA binding proteins bind there to tend to regulate the process of splicing and alternative splicing. What you can also see is the most, the second most overrepresented category here is in intergenic, meaning outside of the protein coding regions of those messenger RNAs and that's why I highlighted in the previous slide the regulatory sequences in red because many of these intergenic sequences fall right into those gene regulatory sequences. And what I hope you can see is that when you talk about changes that actually change the protein coding capacity, there are those very tiny slivers right next to, right to the left of that dark blue section that denotes the intronic section. There's about four different slivers that are all the protein coding changes. And so you can see how much larger these non-coding changes denoted in blue and red, green and purple are as compared to protein coding changes. Okay. And so just to overemphasize that, remember here the, the sequences that we're talking about are these intronic sequences overrepresented by these white boxes in between the, the colored boxes that denote the protein coding regions of the mRNAs.
So in general, the biggest class of disease, or the biggest, the largest amount of disease-causing SNPs fall within these white boxes, these intronic sequences, these non-coding sequences, versus those protein coding sequences that are denoted by the colored boxes. And so this was incredibly intriguing to us. This was very intriguing to us in our own work because one of the things that we study in our own work is emphasized on this slide here. And one of the things that we, we do in profiling and in, in profiling in my lab is we think about how RNA is regulated. And this is also why I spent quite a bit of time talking about regulation of alternative splicing on that second slide, because this is one of the processes that we think about all the time. Okay? And so involved in regulating that process of splicing, which you can see overrepresented on this slide here, are a group of proteins known as RNA binding proteins, which bind to regions of the intron, sometimes bind to regions of the exon, and regulate that process of normal splicing and alternative splicing. And what I also want to overrepresent for you on this slide here is that in general, RNAs are always bound by proteins. They're touched all, o they're all over their length by proteins in the introns and the protein coding portions. In the non-coding portions that are also exonic, those untranslated regions. But the point being here is one of the things that we were interested in gaining was a global look at all regions of an RNA that were being bound by RNA binding proteins. Because in order to figure out how RNAs are regulated, you need to get a global map of everywhere that, that, that proteins are binding onto RNAs on a global scale. And to go back to that genomics slide, my lab is a genomics lab. So we develop high throughput or large scale types of experimental approaches to look at these types or to gain these types of information within the lab. And so what I'm going to show you in the next slide is one of the protocols that we came up with within my lab to gain an, a global look, a genomics look, a genome wide look at everywhere that RNAs are touched by these RNA binding proteins. Okay, And I'm going to show you what these regions look like in the data, how we call them. And then what I'm going to show you is, in fact, when we take all of these regions of mRNAs in humans that are bound by RNA binding proteins, and we say, if you take these regions and look for those disease-causing or disease-linked SNPs, by taking that list of GWAS SNPs and taking that list of directly linked disease SNPs from, from the OMIM database, also known as DB SNP or database of SNPs, and you say, these disease-causing SNPs or linked SNPs, how many of them underlie the regions of the protein coding genome that we see being bound by RNA binding proteins? Is there an overrepresentation? What I'm going to show you is there's an incredible overrepresentation. And what I'm also going to show you is when we go in and change the normal allele to the disease allele, we can literally affect the ability of an RNA binding protein to interact with those regions, either increasing its interaction or breaking its interaction, suggesting that a major disease causing mechanism in humans might be actually that these SNPs affect the ability of RNA binding proteins, including these splicing regulators, to interact with their, their cognate recognition sequences. And so the, the, re the way that we do this is we basically came up with the first RNA's footprinting approach. What I mean by this is RNA in bacterial cells, human cells, basically in any normal cell on the face of the planet is normally degraded by a group of enzymes known as ribonucleases. Ribonuclease means what they do is they come in and they find the strands of ribonucleotides, making up your RNA molecules, and they sit there and they degrade them. Okay? So the RNases are naturally occurring on Earth. They're used to degrading RNA. That's their entire job on this planet is to degrade the strands of ribonucleotides into smaller pieces, actually down into their single nucleotide level so that those nucleotides can be recycled and reused then. So we'd use these ribonucleases for our own purposes because we can purify them out of bacterial cells and eukaryotic cells and then use them to digest RNA, which you don't normally want to do being an RNA biology lab. Usually we try to protect our RNAs against RNases. But what we realized is if we take RNA with the, R with the proteins still on there. What these RNases are going to do is eat up all of the RNA that isn't being bound by these RBPs. So basically the point being is we put the RNases in there with the RNA with the protein still bound, the RNA binding protein still bound. Let it digest up all the regions that aren't being bound by proteins. 
We then purify out the sequences that were protected from digestion because of the bound RBP, clone and sequence that on one of these high throughput sequencers or these genome-wide types of sequencing approaches or sequencers, genome-wide sequencers. We also have to make a control library where we get rid of the proteins and just take the normal RNAs, degrade them up with our RNAs just to find the RNAs resistant regions clone and sequence the RNAs resistant regions, and then compare the library with the proteins to the library without the proteins and say, what sequences do we see only when the RBPs are there versus when the RBPs are not there? And so what I'm showing you at the very bottom of this slide here, the footprinting sample, that denotes the, the samples that we made with the proteins there. The RNAs digestion control samples, those were the samples made when we got rid of the proteins and said, what are the RNAs resistant regions of the, of the transcriptome from human cells? And what I hope you can see is we see peaks or lots and lots of sequencing reads in the regions that are being bound by proteins, specifically in the footprinting sample, the protein bound sample, and these regions disappear then in those RNAs control samples. And so these are the types of regions of the genome that we went through and identified on a global or genome wide scale. We found all of them. We just said, where are all the regions of the protein coding mRNAs in two different human cell types? Um, I'm only going to talk today about HeLa cells. In hu this human cell type known as HeLa cells, where are all the protein bound regions within these HeLa cell um, RNAs? And just to remind you, right, what we were trying to get at here were all, what we next wanted to say then, once we identified all these RNA binding protein binding sites, one of the things that we wanted to say was, if we look, if we take these disease-linked and disease-causing SNPs from the GWAS and the OMIM database respectively, could we see an overrepresentation of these types of SNPs within the regions of the genome that we're calling as being bound by an RNA binding protein once the genome is turned into an RNA? So I'm just going to remind you, these data sets are available as I, as I suggested previously. So we took all of the SNPs out of OMIM which in the slides I'm going to show you here in a second are denoted by DB SNP or database of human SNPs. We also took all of those human disease linked SNPs from all of the published GWAS studies that it had been funded by the um, Human Genome Research Institute at the NIH. So we took these two lists of SNPs and wh what we merely said was, is there an enrichment of these disease causing SNPs, as I said, denoted on the left hand bar of this slide the DB SNP bar. These are the directly linked SNPs that we took out of OMIM, the directly linked SNPs to human disease, versus those GWAS or the human link, disease linked SNPs that have been found by all the GWAS studies to date. And we said, is there an overrepresentation for these SNPs underlying the regions of the protein coding genome that we're saying can be bound by RNA binding proteins once that protein coding gene is turned into a messenger RNA? Okay. So what this is saying now is that many of these disease causing SNPs from the DB SNP and these disease linked SNPs are falling right within regions of the genome. If you think of this as an RNA binding protein and this is an RNA region, this is then the small sequence, right, denoted between my fingers here that was bound by that RBP. We're finding that many of these SNPs fall right within these regions that were bound by the RBPs. Okay, and so what this suggested to us then was that we're not looking, or that we're, we might be missing a very important mechanism underlying the biology that leads to human genetic disorders, which was what might be going on is in fact these SNPs disrupt or enhance the ability of an RNA binding protein to bind to that region, which would then affect either the stability, how long the RNA stays around, splicing as I talked about for quite a while. At the beginning of my talk, we think that that's a major one, is that basically many of these SNPs as I showed you, fall within introns, affect the ability to splice the RNAs properly, make the RNAs and the underlying proteins properly in one cell type versus another, for instance. And this is then a ma potentially a major mechanism of disease. So to begin testing this idea, the point being would be that if our idea was, if, you know, to begin, if our idea is correct, what we would need to do or what we need, be, need to be able to see is if we take the normal allele versus the disease allele at one of these protein bound sites and compare the ability then to, of a protein to bind to these sites, we should see that the disease allele affects that protein's ability to bind in one way or another. So we tested this with two specific SNPs. 
Um, the, two, the two SNPs are designated on this slide here. The top SNP falls within a region of the Urod mRNA. This is once again not a protein coding change. This affects, uh, this is a, what's known as a synonymous SNP, meaning this SNP does not change the underlying amino acid that is uh, encoded at that position, but this SNP has been directly linked to porphyria, the disease porphyria. So this was one of the SNPs that we were very interested in because what you can see here, um, also denoted by then the yellow bar at the very bottom of that graph, was this was a region, once again, that we had found to be protein bound within a human cell type. Okay, and so what that blue bar represents then up there on the transcript model is that is the region of the probe that we generated to say is there a protein that we can say binds to this region? And if we take the normal versus the disease allele, can we see difference in protein binding between these two different alleles using that little RNA piece in an in vitro type of assay? Now at the bottom, on the bottom panel here, once again, this is another synonymous SIP meaning it doesn't change the protein coding capacity of the PARC7 transcript. You still get the PARC7 protein from this, but it's a synonymous SNP that has been linked once again to Parkinson's disease. And this is once again a direct SNP because both of these SNPs came out of that OMEM database. This was a SNP once again directly linked to Parkinson's from a numerous Parkinson's patient. And so once again, we made that blue probe right in that region saying if we take the normal allele versus the disease allele, could we see differences in protein binding? Okay, so we used a specific type of assay to look at this. As I said, we took a probe, which you can see in this slide here. The normal is overrepresented on the left as the A shown in black. So that would be the normal allele. We made a probe right around these disease link SNPs, meaning we had seven base pairs, sorry, we had eight base pairs upstream, eight base pairs downstream, and the disease-linked or disease-causing allele then was right in the middle of our RNA probe. We radioactively labeled the phi prime end of these probes. We then incubated with a protein lysate and ran it on a protein gel, and then looked for radioactivity within our gel, meaning then if you see radioactivity in this protein gel, it means the RNA binding protein is bound to this radioactive probe at that region leading to then it migrating to the size of the protein that was bound to this region. And then what we were looking for was to compare the signal in the normal allele, the radioactive signal in the normal allele versus the disease linked or disease causing, in this case, the two disease causing um, alleles. So the point being here is I'm gonna show you two auto radiography graphs. And what you're looking for here, what we were looking for and what I hope to convince you of is we were looking for differences in the lane that's marked normal versus the signal that we see in the lane marked disease allele. And so with these two different disease linked or disease causing SNPs, the top one was that porphyria causing um, SNP and the bottom one was that Parkinson's causing SNP. What I hope you can see is in the case of the porphyria allele, um, the normal allele tends to bind an RNA binding protein that's approximately 100 kilodaltons in size better than the disease allele. In fact, the disease allele affects um, about 50% or a little over 50% of the ability of this RNA binding protein to bind to that specific region of that protein coding mRNA. In the case of the Parkinson's linked or Parkinson's causing allele, what we found was the opposite phenotype and we're happy to see this that every disease allele doesn't just break an RNA binding protein RNA interaction. In fact, some of them actually recruit RNA binding proteins better. And in this case, the disease allele actually about 200 times, but bound an RNA binding protein about 236% better um, than that normal allele. And so what this suggested to us is in fact that our hypothesis or our mechanism of, of human disease allele biology might actually be an incredibly understudied but still very important mechanism by which some of these human um, genetic disorders are actually being caused. And so one of the things that we want to continue looking at in the future is to continue looking at these non-coding SNPs, which I showed you are the biggest portion of disease-linked and disease-causing SNPs, both within OMIM and within the GWAS catalog to figure out the mechanism. Is this mechanism, by affecting an RNA binding protein RNA interaction, is this a major mechanism of, of human disease? Or is this the major mechanism of biology behind human, some human diseases? And so with that,
I'd like to thank you and the members of my lab that were involved in the study and did the work um, are marked on the slide here with the asterisks and their names are obviously um, a little bit bigger um, in the typeface. So thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you guys today.